now and work forward. And like I said, probably in the next few weeks we'll be going at it some more. I really think it's going to be somewhat of a theme uh, for, for the church, um, possibly throughout the year. She mentioned several times in the prophetic utterance about 2019. And uh, many of the things she said is along the line of what the Lord has been speaking to me about as, you know, teach my people to wait upon the Lord for this is a season when he's going to birth his dreams and his visions on the inside of us. Uh, but one of the great things that the body of Christ is lacking, I think, is understanding what it means to wait upon the Lord and the promises that are, that are that are in the scriptures. And uh, there's a lot of them. But Psalm number 25 is one of the Psalms that uh, does deal with it quite a bit. And verse number 3 says, yea, yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. You drop down to verse 5. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Verse 21. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Uh, one of the things we understand is that Psalm 25 is the understanding is that it was written by David. And uh, I went back and looked at several of the different Psalms that David wrote. And one of the things that I found was a theme of David's life was talking about waiting upon the Lord. Was talking about waiting upon God. So apparently this was a big part of David's life and David's relationship with the Lord. And we know that God tells David that he's a man after God's own heart. <laughs> So when we're looking at relationship with God, there's a lot that we can learn from David. Um, one thing we understand, something here, as this is coming so much in the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms is a worship book. And basically what these are, are worship psalms that was used by the Israelites for worship. So when we're reading these things and it's talking about these things, it's teaching us about worship. So apparently, since it's such a prominent thing throughout many of the Psalms, that waiting upon God is meant to be a major part of worship. And waiting upon God is to be an element of worship that should be very strong in our worship service, in our personal relationship with God, in our walk with God. When we come to the Lord, and, and so to speak, we offer ourselves up to Him. And uh, quite often when we do the, the Saturday night prayer meeting, the Saturday night intercession, quite often that's what I do. I don't come here. I don't do a lot of intercession. I'm not necessarily praying and interceding for anybody or necessarily. One of the things I do is I wait on God. And I just come and I say, Lord, here I am. Speak to me. Do what needs to be done in my heart. Speak to me what you want to speak to me. God, here I am. I am just being attentive to you. I'm listening to you. I want to hear from you. God, I just want to be in your presence. Whatever you want to look at it, but God, I'm here to wait upon you. One of the things we've got to understand is waiting upon God. I'm not talking about waiting necessarily as, as something, you know, as just standing and waiting in line. You know, I don't know about any of you guys, but, you know, one of the most principal things that I've done recently was a few days before Christmas, I went to Walmart. And it was awful. And I mean, I was standing there in line. I don't know for how long I was buying one item. And the, 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 the people at the cashiers were like this. I think they were having a contest to see who could move the slowest. And I'm watching them do this, and I'm looking at all of the people ahead of me, and they all got carts heaping full, and I'm standing way at the end with one item. Watch them do this. That's not what I'm talking about, I'm waiting upon God. I'm not talking about just standing there and waiting upon God because God is slow. I'm, uh, one of the pictures that I always remember, and to me, every time I think about waiting upon God, I think about a certain dinner that I ate one time in Mexico. And it was in Juarez, Mexico, and I'm sitting at a table eating, me and a, a friend of mine in this restaurant, and there were two waiters. And they stood like this the whole time and just waited for us to ask for something. And when you ask for something, they get it, they bring it to you, boom, they would stand there. And I assume they thought we were Americans, we were going to get a big tip probably. Didn't work out very well for them. They were not that much I didn't do very good tips. Uh, but, but they were just standing there waiting. And they were just waiting upon us to just ask them to do something. 
just waiting upon our beck and call. And we're talking about waiting upon the Lord. One of the things we have to understand is, Lord, here I am. And when God says do this, we're willing to do it. We're ready to move. God, here we are. We're waiting upon you, Father God, for our services. We're, we're beginning praise and worship. We're waiting upon you, Lord. And when the Spirit of God prompts us, we're ready and willing and eager to move with what God speaks to us. Now, if we're going to stand there and wait upon God and God's going to say, Andy, do this. And Andy's going to say, oh, I don't really want to do that. Then we're not really waiting upon God. Waiting upon God implies that we are surrendered to Him. The book of Romans tells us we come to Him, we offer ourselves up as a living sacrifice to the Lord. In other words, we're laying ourselves upon the altar and we're saying, Lord, here I am. What would you have me to do? What would you want to speak to me? What would you want to lead me to do or guide me to do? One of the great examples of it that I've always used is, is Acts chapter 13. And it talks about there were certain prophets and teachers. And, and they were there and they began to pray and fast. And it says they just began to minister unto the Lord. And they began to praise Him and worship Him. And in that setting, the Holy Spirit spoke to them and sent Paul and Silas out to the mission field. And so they were there, they were waiting upon the Lord. They were praying, they were fasting, they were listening to the Spirit of God, but they were praying and fasting and listening to the Spirit of God with a heart that was prepared to obey what He spoke. It doesn't do a lot of good to wait upon God for Him to speak to us so we can disobey Him. Amen? Mm -hmm. Y'all looking at me. Look at verse 3. We're going to just dig into this meaning of some of these words. Yea, let not the weight on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. That word weight there is a fascinating Hebrew word. It means to bind together. Remember that part of the definition. To bind together. Because that's going to become very important what I teach tonight. To expect, to look patiently, or to tear. I look at now the, what's it called, Spirit-filled Life Bible, and they give Greek and Hebrew definitions in there. And what the definition they gave for that was just absolutely amazing in regards to what I was teaching. It says, to bind together, note that key part again, through a process of intertwining the virtual envelopment of the soul with God. To foster, here's the part I want to begin with, to foster a sensitivity to his presence and his promptings. Allowing him to reveal attitudes or sins that would dull our sensitivity to his voice. But it's waiting upon God, we're going to see that one of the things that will do is enable us to hear his voice better. Because anything in our heart or in our lives that hinders us from hearing His voice well, God is going to begin to deal with while we're waiting upon Him. You know, there's different ways of hearing, isn't there? I mean, I, I can hear right now. And you can hear my voice right now. But there's different ways we can hear something. I mean, we can tell Mario or Nathan up here, and we can probably sit over here behind a, uh, a curtain, and take a guitar and play C chord and F chord and G7 chord, and they can tell us exactly what chord we're playing. We can play a, a you know, a, a, a A chord or B chord or what have you, and even though they're not seeing it, they can hear that chord and recognize and say, that's an A chord. Because they have a way of hearing that's obviously a natural talent, but it's also something that's been trained and developed in their life to play music. Now, if I was to try to do that, I would probably miss most of the time and be guessing. You see, I would be dull of hearing in that realm, in that area. I can hear well, but in that area, I would be dull of hearing. And the Bible talks about that we can grow dull of hearing spiritually. I was talking this morning about the parable of the sower, and in the parable of the sower, those that close their eyes to understanding what Jesus was teaching, one of the things it says about them is they were dull of hearing. So they weren't hearing. Jesus was standing right in front of them. Jesus is teaching them. 
and they weren't really hearing him. They were hearing his words, but they weren't hearing from the Spirit of God. The Bible talks about, in the end of the book of Acts, with the, the last part of Paul's ministry that we know of, and, and he's talking about how, how the Israelites or the Jewish people were dull of hearing to the gospel, and as a result of that, God was taking the gospel to the Gentiles because they would hear. The Bible talks about it in the book of Hebrews, and it's kind of chastising some people there, and telling them that they should be teachers, but yet they, 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 they can't be taught anything about the meat of the word. They've only got to be receiving milk because they are dull of hearing. So one of the things we have to be careful of is we can grow dull of hearing in the spirit world. And one of the things that we can do to, to help repair that situation is to learn to wait upon God. God, here I am. Speak to me. Lord God, here I am. And spending time in the presence of God. You know what? It's an odd thing. I, I've come to the conclusion over the years that the church is the only place where we're taught all the time, but there's never any accountability. I mean, think about it. You go to school and you, and, and, and you go to classes and you're taught. What do you what do? You do? You're eventually going to have a test, aren't you? You know, you, you go to any kind of thing where you're taught anything, any kind of class, you're going to be taught something, and then you're going to be held accountable. And, okay, here's a test. Let me see if you're learning. You go on your job, and, and they begin to teach you how to do a, do, do a new job. Well, eventually the day's coming when they're going to expect to be able to turn you loose and you do that job. You're going to be accountable on whether or not you can run that machine or do that particular job. But it's funny, in the church, the way we do church so often today, you can come and you can sit in a sanctuary and, and people can stand up and teach you the Word of God, and you can sit there your whole life and be dull of hearing and nobody ever knows. Because there's no account that we do learn. But you see, we're supposed to be in a church, we're supposed to be in a situation to where we're being discipled. And for some reason, somewhere along the line, we shifted gears. And so often we begin to become where we're trying to entertain people so we can have a big crowd rather than disciple people. And so we can sit in, in church and, and be dull of hearing and nobody ever knows. Or you just see you come in on Sunday morning and Sunday night maybe and, and sit there and you look good and, and go home and never really receiving the word of God or hearing much from God. And the way to solve that is to learn to wait upon God. To learn to get into his presence. You see, one of the key things we'll find that waiting upon God and fasting both aid our sensitivity to hearing the voice of God. In Isaiah chapter 58, which is a chapter that deals primarily with fasting, and one of the promises there about fasting is that God's light will break forth. One of the promises in Isaiah chapter 58 is that God will lead us and guide us continually as a result of our fasting. As I was thinking about this and, and kind of medita meditating on this teaching, I thought, you know, one of the things, or two of the reasons that I personally fast for more than any one thing, generally speaking, when I go on any kind of fast, whether it be a very short-term fast, a long-term fast of any kind, I'm, I'm doing it for two, one or two reasons. We've been having church, and the Spirit of God has not been moving. And so I, I need to pray, and I need to fast, and I need to deal with that and find out why. Because the Spirit of God is supposed to move in our services. And if the Spirit of God is not moving, something is wrong. And the only thing I know to do is to pray and fast. The other reason that I feel fine that I fast most of the time is because I feel like, hey, I'm getting dull here, and I'm not hearing from God. Really. I'm really struggling when I get my sermons ready, and I'm really struggling when I get ready to teach God's Word. I'm really struggling, and the gifts don't seem to be manifesting through me much, and, and, and it just, there's that time where it seems like I'm growing dull of hearing, then I will find that I have to, at that point in time, to begin to fast and increase my waiting upon the Lord. And as I do that, then there becomes a real increase in my ability to hear the voice of God. You see, you'll find as we study some of this that throughout the book of Psalms, it's talking about in their worship, waiting upon God. And I'm not knocking anybody. I'm not picking on anybody. 
went to a great degree, that's an element that's been eliminated from worship. <coughs> we come in, we, we, we sing a few songs, we have a, a little sermon, we go home. And if you would have a time and a service of waiting upon God, people would try to figure out, what are you doing? Because we don't do it in our personal life enough, we come into a service and do it and we're lost. Hallelujah. Now the pastor's going to expect us to do something. <laughs> to bind together. I remember quite some time ago studying that definition of waiting upon the Lord. And I thought to bind together that seems kind of odd. I mean, obviously, God doesn't change. So if by waiting upon God, we're going to be bound together, we're going to be intertwined together, that means that somehow or another, through waiting upon God, I'm going to change. Through waiting upon God, I'm going to be bound together with Him. means that through waiting upon God, change and apparently become more like him and more in line with him and more and, and more 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 closer to who he is. But yet that's what the Bible tells us is what we're supposed to do, isn't it? We are predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So this life that you and I are living, this walk that we live with the Lord, the purpose of all of this is that we become like Jesus. So if I'm waiting upon the Lord makes me more like Jesus, then apparently that's something that is very rich. Apparently that's something that's very important. If part of our worship were to wait upon God, if part of our walk with God and our prayer time when we're alone with God, we're just supposed to wait upon Him and somehow or another that makes us like Him, then that must be of great importance. Let me show you something. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 18. It says, but we all, with, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So to put that in more easier understood terms, what that's really saying that as we come into the presence of God and we have experience with God, He's going to change us and make us more like Him. How many of you heard the old saying that people always end up looking like their dogs? I didn't used to hear that. I think, well, that, that sounds kind of corny, but if you ever look, a lot of times that's the case. I mean, you look at people walking their dogs down the street and, and pay attention to how often they look the same. I mean, you know, you'll find somebody with a big bulldog and they're kind of this big, squat person and they're walking with that. You know, you find somebody with this more thin dog and you're like prancing and they're prancing and just walking with their dog and, and what have you. But there's similarities. How can you understand that when you are hanging around a bunch of people, you begin to take on similar characteristics? I mean, I know teenagers always resist that idea, but it's true, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You hang around certain people who talk a certain way, and eventually you'll pick up their, their language. You know, if, if people used to make fun of me, and, and uh, when I was a child, I, I lived a lot of different places, and one of the places I lived at for quite some time was in North Carolina. And my family on my mother's side was from Alabama, and they all talked talk very southern. And it's kind of funny, if you put me in the South for a very long period of time, I begin to take on that, that Southern draw and talk that way. But when I'm not around it, I don't. Rachel thinks that's funny. Whenever I say there was, I'll say something, and somebody will say something like that. It's not funny. I was around it all my life. But if you put me, like I lived in Florida for a while, and where I was at there, right there in the Gulf of Mexico, I was around a lot of people who spoke Southern, I came back here, everybody laughed at me for a while because I sounded like I was from the South. In other words, if you're around people, 
You begin to pick up their characteristics, don't you? You begin to pick up words they say, maybe mannerisms they have. When people are married after a while, after a few years of time, they begin to take on a lot of similarities, don't they? They begin to think alike, act alike, have similar taste. And, you know, some married couples, you, you'll ask them, say, well, you guys like steak? No, we don't like steak. Well, you guys, you guys like uh, butter pecan ice cream? Oh, we love butter pecan pecan ice cream. Everything's a we. They have similar taste. They've grown together. And what's all of this have to do with 2 Corinthians 3.18? Because that same principle applies. If you're waiting upon God and you're spending time in God's presence, you're being shaped and molded by who you're hanging out with. You're being shaped and molded by Him. And the more time you spend in his presence, the more time you spend waiting on him, the more you're going to take on the characteristics of God. The more you experience him, the more you're going to be like him. The more times that you're in the presence of the Holy Spirit, the more you're going to be like him. The more time you're looking into the word of God and understanding who he is, the more you're going to be like him. You see, waiting upon the Lord and just being in his presence is of great importance in worship. It's great importance in our prayer life. You see, when we come in here and we begin to praise the Lord and, and worship God and, and the anointing and the Holy Spirit begins to move, a lot more is happening in our lives than us just feeling good about it. We're getting to know Him. We're getting to understand Him. We're getting to be molded and shaped and bent and, and like Him. The most godly, Christ-like people I know on this planet that I've ever known are the people who just fall so much in love with Jesus, they just want to be in His presence. They just want to worship Him. They just want to pray. They just want to wait upon Him. They just want to meditate in the Word. And it's not that they're trying to do any kind of religious duty or any kind of religious activity, but their heart is just so much in love with Jesus, they want to be in His presence. They're like the Apostle Paul who says, I count everything as done, I count everything as lost, that I might know Him. Why? Because he had fallen in love with Jesus. And he wanted to be in His presence. And he began to be changed. Go to Jeremiah chapter 9. You know, again, some of these scriptures that deal with waiting upon the Lord are things that I've studied and I've probably taught on at some point in life, but as I've been going back through them again, there's just been a freshness to things. And, and there was something I read and in, in, in seen in this scripture that I thought was just amazing. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Now, that's an amazing scripture. Because there is something there that just jumped right out at me as I was reading this and thinking about waiting upon the Lord. I mean, obviously it's telling us there that we should not be glorying in, in our success. You know, and I used to tell people that, you know, you always say, well, what would you like on your tombstone? Or and what would you like in your epitaph? And I said, you know, I guess probably the best thing you could have on your tombstone is he knew God. But according to this verse, that's not enough. You see, when we're talking about waiting upon God, and we talk about knowing God, it's not just knowing God that he's talking about here. We're not just supposed to know God. But this to me screams of a very intimate relationship that he understandeth and knoweth me. Now, let me put that in, in context. Now, you get to go up to my wife tonight and say, do you know, Pastor? 
She'd say, yeah. But try something about it. Ask for services, say, do you understand, Pastor? Everybody laughs at stuff like that. I don't understand myself sometimes. But God says there that we are to glory not only that we know God, but that we understand God. So that seems to tell me something. That God is talking about a relationship of such closeness and of such intimacy that we not only get to know who He is, but we press into His presence and we get an understanding of who He is. And we begin to understand God. And that's like Jesus prophecy. I kept saying to confirm things. She kept one of the things she said numerous times was don't be satisfied with where you're at. Don't be satisfied with the presence of God in your life. Don't be satisfied with the anointing of God in your life, but press into His glory. Don't be satisfied, God, I want to know you, but press in. God, I don't only want to know you, but I want to understand you, God. Teach me your ways. That seems to me, and God says... And that is what he delights. And I was reading and I thought, Lord, I think that's a level of relationship that maybe we haven't really taken into account. I mean, somebody can in and say, do you know God? What's my kid? He says, do you understand <laughs> That's a big one, Pastor. That's what the Bible says, does not to read that again. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. No, don't glory in your earthly wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his mind. Don't glory in your strength and your power. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Don't glory in your wealth. But let him that glorieth glorieth in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. God is saying, I want you to understand me. And I want you to know me. And that is my delight. That you press in. And that you wait upon me. And say God teach me who you are. Give me understanding. Of not only who you are God. But of your ways. Hallelujah. That sounds like quite a church service. Don't it? You see, can you imagine people coming into a church, opening up services, having worship, and a gathering of people with hearts who hunger after God to know Him? A gathering of people who hunger in their hearts to, to understand Him? And are here seeking God, saying, God, teach me who you are. God, teach me your ways. I'll wait upon you, Lord. Here we are, Father God, in your presence. We'll wait upon you, God, to hear your voice. We'll wait upon you, God, to, to give us understanding. We'll wait upon you, God, to reveal yourself to us at a level we've never known before. God, we're not satisfied with where we're at, but God, we're going to wait upon you, Father God, and wait upon you, God, and wait upon you until you manifest your glory in our presence. Hallelujah! Huh? <laughs> they don't get too excited. Pastor wants to be here all night waiting on God. <laughs> you may say that sounds like a bit much, Pastor. From Psalm 25, I'll show you that this is all right here in the Word. Verse 3. We just started out with, Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Verse 4, Show me thy ways, Lord. Teach me thy paths. The psalmist in worship is said, Here I am, Lord. I'm waiting upon you, Father God. Show me your ways. Teach me your paths. That word ways there is interesting. A road 
mode, a course of life, a mode of action. I like that. Or a manner. A mode means taking a procedure and how he achieves something. So it's coming to God and saying, God, here we are. We're waiting upon you tonight, Lord. Lord, we, we want you to show us your ways. Show us how you do things. Let us understand you, Lord. Let us understand how you operate. Let us understand how you function. You see, we can understand God and how he does things. And we can understand the ways of God. Simple illustration. The moving of the Holy Spirit. We can understand that. You know what determines one of the key elements of whether the Holy Spirit moves in any given service is our surrender to it. When we come into a service and we're willing to really surrender that service into his hands and to his care and allow him to lead us and guide us and move us and dictate that service, that's going to be a service where the anointing of God will move freely. But if we come in and we have our plans and we're going to sing three songs, we're going to have an announcement, I'm going to preach for a fifth, whatever, and we just have this all orchestrated out, and the Holy Spirit has not given opportunity to move in that service, guess what? He won't. And it's that simple. You come into a service, and you're hungry in your heart for God, and you want to wait upon God, and you want to allow God to move, and you want to be pliable, and allow the Spirit of God to do what He so desires, then the moving of the Holy Spirit will take place. We can understand that. We can understand God in that sense. We can understand how to flow with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, I have people all the time that ask questions about stuff like that and sometimes. And, and my answer is normally the same, that you learn through relationship. Because I can tell you how God leads me in a spiritual gift, and Jenny can tell you how God leads her in a spiritual gift, and it'll be different. Because she's learned by the Holy Spirit, has taught her how to do that. And what I know to do in the, in the gifts of the Spirit, I've learned by the Holy Spirit. He'll move upon me certain ways. I can recognize certain anointings and realize that God wants to go this direction. But it's not through relationship. Show me thy ways, Lord. Let me understand you. Let me understand how the gifts of the Spirit operate so I can flow with you. Let me, let me understand, Lord, how the moving of the Holy Spirit so I can flow with you. Let me understand as a pastor, Lord, when, when things get dry, what I need to do and speak to me, Lord. You see, the Bible says that Jesus didn't do anything but what the Father told him to do. All those nights when he was off in prayer and praying all night, he was there fellowshipping with the Father. The Father would say, go do this tomorrow. He'd go out tomorrow and see that man with the withered hand say, stretch forth your hand. And he'd be healed. Flowing in the Spirit of God. Because he had been waiting upon God. You see, we want the flow without the wait. People all the time, you know, and they see maybe somebody out and, and functioning in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and operating in the things of God. And, Ooh, boy, I want to do that. But maybe they don't want to wait upon God and get to know Him and understand Him. The church wants to be mighty and powerful, but maybe they don't want to wait. And understand him and know him. You see, many of the things that we're going to find that we dig into the Word of God that maybe our hearts desires and our hearts cry for is found as we wait upon the Lord. That word, show me thy ways. Since I looked at some of these words, I thought they're fascinating. To, that word, show there, the Hebrew word, to know, acknowledge, 
to be acquainted with as a familiar friend. Show me your ways, Lord, as you would show a familiar friend your ways. Let me be acquainted with you, Lord, as a familiar friend. You remember there were moments in, in the scriptures where we talk about Mary and Martha all the time. People usually focus on Martha because she was an up running around busy all the time. But Mary was waiting upon the Lord. She was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Here I am, Lord. Speak to me. We find that in John chapter 13 when Jesus was teaching that we find the apostle John slaying there with his head upon the chest of Jesus. Here I am, Lord. Speak to me. We find that Moses was a man who would enter into the tabernacle and into the presence of God. And the word says that God spoke to him face to face as a friend. Let me understand you, Lord. Show me your ways. Abraham was called the friend of God. One of the things that Moses cried out in Exodus chapter 33 where that passage of scripture took place and I'm sure with you was he wanted God to show him his way so that he might know him. I thought about that. You know, I shared this before. I, I think I understand that about some things. And one of the things that gives me some time, and I asked a certain person this one time, it got me kind of funny, but um, you, you, you hear a lot about marriage sometimes. And I'm not saying they're not good things, don't get me wrong, but you hear people all the time talk about you have to work on your marriage. Well, that's a good thing. Um, and I asked one time, I said, does it ever get to the place where it's not work? The person looked at my screen, I said, think about it. I mean, I can say, Rachel, let, let's, let's work on our marriage. But do we ever reach the place to where we're not working on our marriage, to where I just love you and I want to move on? I'm not working on anything. But I just love you and I want to know your heart. And sometimes with God, it's kind of what Moses is saying to God, show me your ways so that I can know you. Wait upon God because, you know, there was a time a while back and it just really hit me. I thought, Lord, I just want to know you. I've tried to understand you and I've tried to know your ways and, 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 and all of these other things. But Lord, has it been because I've wanted to know you and understand your ways because I've wanted to, to be able to minister? Or God, was there a time when my heart was just hungry for your presence, God, just because I simply want to know you because I love you? You see, when we're talking about waiting upon God, we're talking about our relationship getting to the level with God where we just desire to be in His presence because we love Him. Because we want to know Him. And there's great blessings that come with it. When David was getting prepared for the end of his life, and he gave his final instructions to his son Solomon. He told him, Know God and walk in his ways. And God will prosper and bless everything in your life. He told him that you'll have a long life. His final instructions to his son was simply, Know God. And learn to walk in his ways. In other words, Solomon, learn to wait upon God as I did. Remember the one saying that to his son Solomon is the one who wrote these words to wait upon God. The one who gave that advice to his son Solomon is the one who penned so many of the Psalms where it talks about time and time and time again about waiting upon God. Psalm 25. I'm writing down here. 
If you will, you go get Dana. Psalm 25, verse 9. Here's another passage that's kind of interesting. Another verse. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. Show me thy ways, Lord. Teach me thy paths. I'm waiting on you, God. You see, that meekness and waiting comes right together. And meekness doesn't mean it's wimpy. You know, we think so often of somebody who's being meek and meek and mild as somebody who's maybe been kind of wimpy in life. But that word meek there, and I'm going to have to kind of get some instruction with it, means lowly and poor and humble. You see, when we wait upon the Lord, it's not talking about being poor or being in poverty. But man was designed to live totally dependent upon a God of unsearchable riches. Man was created and designed to wait upon a God of eternal abundance, unsearchable riches for him to bring his provision into our life. To not wait upon God is to assume that we can do it ourselves. To not wait upon God is to assume that we don't need His direction, His instruction, knowledge of His ways, is to assume that we can live life our own way and it be okay. When we come to a place of humility, and we can say we are poor in spirit in the sense that I'm totally dependent upon you, Lord. I'm waiting upon you, Lord, for every direction. I'm waiting upon you, Lord, for instruction. I'm waiting upon you, Lord, to show me your ways. And I'm not moving until you do. We've reached the place of meekness. We've reached the place of humility. Most of you have heard me talk about Heidi Baker, and, and I don't want to go into a big definition, uh, explanation of who she is. She's a lady who her and her husband have went to Mozambique and basically seen a tremendous move of God. Probably thousands of churches have been planted as a result of it. Just the dead are raised regularly. I mean, just phenomenal ministry. Probably one of the most powerful ministries along that line that this world has ever seen. And in definition of this, she gives, the, she gives the illustration of comparing what she does in Mozambique with the Western Church of America. And she says, you know, when we go out to minister there, we don't have any decorated altars. We don't have any musical instruments. We don't have air conditions and furnaces and heat. We don't have all of those comforts. We don't have computers with PowerPoints and all of that stuff. We don't have any light shows or any smoke shows. We have no entertainment. And we go out there, we open up our Bible in the middle of nowhere and nothing and we preach. And we trust God to come and perform miracles in the lives of individuals. And if God don't show up, we have absolutely nothing to offer. That's poor in spirit. Is when we realize if God don't show up, we have nothing to offer. <coughs> when I get up and teach, if God don't show up, trust me, I have nothing to offer. I really don't have anything to give you. If the anointing don't come, What's the use? She described it this way. Her definition. Wholly given, totally dependent, fully yielded, completely desperate for God. Completely desperate. You see, that's something that we have to really look at our lives and ask ourselves. 
Are we in a place in life that we are completely desperate for God? That we are just at the place where when I talk about waiting upon God and, and beloved to where it doesn't, we're, we're willing to abandon everything and forsake everything to just wait upon Him and not to move until the glory of God shows up. You see, the problem, beloved, is so often in the church world, we've gotten to the place where we've grown content with what we have. As Gina was speaking about when she was giving her prophetic utterance, don't be content. Because as long as we are content with where we at, we will never go forth and see the glory of God. As long as we are content with what we have, we'll never be waiting upon the Lord until He shows up with more. If God doesn't have a sense of spiritual desperation on the inside of us, we're never going to be willing to get on our face and wait upon Him until the glory of God comes into the house. Show me thy ways. Lead me into your past. I'm fascinated with that verse. That God delights in us not just knowing Him, but understanding Him. He's talking about us pressing into a place, beloved, that we probably haven't touched upon. Do we have such an understanding of God that we can flow in His ways and walk in His past? And walk in His glory. But we can't get there unless we wait upon Him and allow Him to be the teacher. I can't come up with the ideas. I, I can't find it in a textbook somewhere in some Bible college. We have to be so desperate. God, I wait upon you. This is not enough. This life I'm living is not enough. Without his glory, it's not enough. I was reading a book written by a gentleman named Andrew Murray. He was passed a long time ago, lived in like 1800s and wrote a lot of books. And he was writing about when he had spoke at a minister's conference, and I believe it was in South Africa. And he was talking about what he addressed the minister's conference about. And he was teaching them about waiting upon God. And he says, I'm talking about waiting until we have a deeper manifestation of the presence of God in our life than we've ever known before. And he challenged them to do that for that conference and not to be satisfied with anything less. I challenge you tonight. I challenge you to make a decision in the depths of your heart. God, I'm going to get in your presence. I'm going to wait upon you, God, until I taste your glory. challenge you in your life to make waiting upon God part of your daily life. To make that kind of worship where you just get on your face before God and say, God, here I am. Please teach me your ways. Give me understanding of you, Lord. Press in. God, that I may know you. I wait upon you, Lord. I can't be satisfied without with anything less than the greatness of your presence. I can't be satisfied with anything less than being like Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. I can't be satisfied with anything less than being in that tabernacle like Moses and, 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 and speaking with you face to face. I can't be satisfied with anything less what you spoke about in the book of Jeremiah where I'm to know you and to understand you. 
I can't be satisfied with anything less than the psalmist speaks of when he talks about waiting upon you and crying out to you to show us your ways and your paths. I can't be satisfied less with anything, Lord, than that place of desperation where I just wait upon you. I know your anointing's here and I know your presence here. But God, I hunger for so much more. I hunger, Father God, in the depths of my heart for so much more. Not just a little touch. Not a good church service. But God, to step into the realms of your glory. <laughs> Lord, I wait upon you. We wait upon you, Father. Holy Spirit, fall. sensitivity to your spirit that would hinder our walk with you in any way, shape, or form. Let your spirit, Father God, just move amongst us tonight. Let your anointing just move amongst us. Search our hearts and search our lives and prepare our people for your glory. God, prepare our people who are hungry. Prepare our people to wait upon you to understand, Father God, that worship is not just singing and shouting and dancing, though all of that is great. But there's a worship that just lays before you. It says, Lord, here I am. I hunger for you, Father. I hunger for your presence. I hunger to understand you. I hunger to know your ways, God. I'm not satisfied anymore. Like the prophetic utterance said, don't be satisfied. I'm not satisfied anymore, Father. Tonight's been a good service, but I'm not satisfied. Your presence has been precious, but I'm not satisfied, Father. I want to know you. I want to understand you. My God, show us your ways. Teach us your past. My God, she will shut down the shut Show us your glory. As Moses cried out, Father, show me your glory. Let me be changed from glory to glory into your image. Let us be changed from glory to glory into your image. My God, I pray. Let your glory come. Spirit of God will lead you to do it right now. God, I have you to get someone.